Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church. On behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers and members of our church, we're just so blessed that you are joining us for our General Sunday School Lesson Overview. Uh, as always, we thank you for sharing your time with us. It's our prayer that if you are a believer, that your faith is strengthened and encouraged with these lessons. And if you, by chance, are a non-believer, that God continues to reveal himself to you in a deeper way uh, so that you can understand his love for you and that prayerfully you'll be drawn out of darkness into the marvelous light and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've been following us these last four plus years, we're just so thankful for your presence, for your support, but most importantly for your prayers. And it's our desire that we've been doing God's will as we share these general lesson overviews. Today's lesson is entitled Hope in Christian Fellowship, and it's taken from the second and the third chapters of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 13 through 20, that's the end of the second chapter, and then the first five verses, chapter three, verses one through five. And so our key verse is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, and it reads, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So we have three lessons or three goals in today's lesson. First, we will examine the conditions in Christian relationships during times of separation. Secondly, we will celebrate the bonds of love, care, and togetherness that we share amongst all believers. And then third and finally, we will commit to strengthening, renewing, and encouraging our Christian brothers and sisters whenever God gives us the opportunity. And so we'll jump right into this lesson, not a terribly long lesson, but as always, thank you for joining with us. Uh, we ask that you would consider subscribing to our channel, turning on notifications. You'll get all of our content our Sunday morning worship, our Wednesday evening Bible study, and as you like and share our lessons, you'll help spread it to a wider audience, and prayerfully we'll be able to uh, draw non-believers closer to Christ in our work. Uh, we'll begin with prayer and then jump right in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you that even when we're away from each other, you have given us a common bond and a unity, which is our faith and our uh, love that we have for each other and our faith and love that we have in you. And so, God, strengthen us, encourage us, help us to understand your word in a deeper and clearer way that we might be better examples of the Christians that you have taught us to be. And we are praying for each person that's watching and listening right now that you would encourage us in our faith and grow us uh, uh, through this lesson that we might be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. It is in your son, Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So the first part of our lesson is entitled An Enthusiastic People. It's taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. And reading from the New King James Version, the text reads, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea and Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. So our lesson begins with... Uh, Paul, who's the author of, the, of, of this book of the Bible, Paul is expressing this thankfulness for the, Thessal, uh, the church in Thessalonica, the Thessalonian church, because of their response to the word of God. So we'll kind of get into it maybe a little bit later, but uh, Paul, in his missionary journey, uh, he visited this area and he preached the gospel, and there were a small group of Jewish believers there, and then there were some Greeks and Romans there, and they just embraced the gospel and Paul was very excited about the way that they embraced the gospel and converted into Christians but as he continued on his journey he wanted urgently to go back because he was worried not only because they didn't have a strong knowledge of of the law of Old Testament scripture or prophecy 
but because there were so many competing religions and the threat of the Romans, uh, uh, the Romans governmental system was really was like this own uh, um, uh, uh, theology in itself. And then you had those Jews that were in the area were really trying to put an end to Christianity. So Paul recognizes the challenges that this early church was against and he wanted to desperately get back there. But the more that he heard and as word began to spread about what was happening in the church and the short time that he was there, what he had witnessed with his own eyes, he starts this lesson with this thankfulness. He's so excited about the way that they responded to the word of God. And so Dr. Backus, our pastor here, when he prays at the end of our uh, sermons, uh, uh, at the end of our services, uh, sometimes before he preaches, he, he often prays that we not just be hearers of the word, but that we be doers of the word. And for many believers, uh, one of the problems with the church today is that we've heard the word of God and we know the word of God, but we're not allowing God's word to change the way that we live. And that's why you get so many people saying that the church is full of hypocrites because we have learned what God's desire and his will is for our lives, yet our actions don't necessarily uh, replicate our commitment or our confession of faith. And so Paul recognizes what's happening in this early church, and he's just overwhelmed with joy. He expresses this ongoing thankfulness to God but he, because it appears that their faith has matured into this healthy and ongoing response to God's word. Uh, how do we respond to God's word? It often happens in stages. We first respond to God's word based on the initial excitement and the celebration of our faith as we're converted into believers. So that moment that you believe and when you first become excited, I often tell the story, when I really owned my faith, I went and bought Bibles, I changed all my radio stations to gospel radio, I swore I wouldn't listen to secular music again, only watched uh, Christian television programming, uh, and I was just so wrapped up with the real excitement that I was really taking ownership of my faith and being active in my faith. And so that's one of the stages of our excitement. And then there are times when we respond differently to God's word or with excitement to God's word based on the circumstances of life. That's when uh, things are either going really well or we have our back against the wall and we have no place to turn but God. And then we just kind of fully dive into God's word, uh, asking God to make a way out of nowhere, calling on God, crying out to God, asking for God to step in and deal with the situations that we're dealing with. Uh, but a mature faith, uh, a, a, a growing faith uh, responds to God's word based on our knowledge of God and our experience with God. And it surpasses conditions or circumstances. So a mature faith, it doesn't really matter what's happening in your life or what's going on. We maintain our excitement of, in God's word because we've acknowledged and experienced enough of God where the, the today's issues don't impact our faith as much as it would at other times. And so as believers, that's the place we want to get to. We want to get to that mature faith where regardless what's happening, regardless what's going on, our faith is solid and steadfast. And this is the type of faith that Paul is identifying in the church in Thessalonica. He's saying that he's excited about their faith because their response to God's word seems to be enduring the hardships that they're experiencing. So here Paul celebrates with thankfulness because the Thessalonica, or the church in Thessalonica, they accepted the word of God as truth from God and not truth from man. Now, unfortunately, time has taught us that when we look at man's word, it fails and it has proven to be insufficient. But God's word, the word of God, scripture, the promises of God, the prophecies of God, have endured the ages, and they've always proven to be true. And so even when man's, the word of man is good intentioned, it can't be depended on or trusted, but God's word always can be depended on and always can be trusted. So the truth of God's word does not only elicit a response of faith, but it also proves to have this ongoing response in the life of the believers that Paul is writing to. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul writes to Timothy, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. It literally means that when we seek out God's word from a position of faith, 
after learning God's word and internalizing God's word, his word begins to change our lives by altering the way that we think, the way that we act, but most importantly, the way that we treat others in the spirit of God's love. And so when God's word is in us, when we move from a position of faith in God's word and seek out God's word and learn and and, and incorporate God's word more into our lives, it changes who we are. It changes the way we think. Uh, I I, I was, uh, there was this uh, podcast series that came out uh, right at the middle of the the basketball season. It was with LeBron James and J.J. Redick. And people didn't understand how great of students of the game of basketball the two of them are. And so they did like six or seven episodes before J.J. Reddit became the head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. But in those six or seven episodes, they would watch game tape and break down the movements of basketball players and explain why certain plays worked and why certain plays didn't work and the benefit of moving the ball in certain patterns. And the reason why this was so important was because lay people, people that weren't professional basketball players, had an opportunity to actually learn the game of basketball on a professional level. And I've watched common players, younger players that are athletes and take basketball seriously, watch those podcasts over and over and over again, and they begin to change the way that they see the game of basketball and eventually change the way that they play the game of basketball. In the same manner, if we seek out God's word and we read it over and over and over again, it will change the way that we understand God, that we see God, and then eventually it will change the way that we live as believers, as Christians, and the way that we respond to God's word. And so this is one of the rewards of faith that is given by God as his spirit that's inside each and every one of us, as it directs us towards his word, it gives us understanding of his word, and it causes us to respond to the situations of life based on the word of God that's in us. And so... Uh, uh, there was a preacher named Joshua West. He's in Springfield. He gave this illustration, and I've, I've shared it before, but he said that our, our lives, our bodies, our minds, our hearts, our spirits are like a sponge. And when we put a sponge in liquid, whatever it is that we soak up, when we're squeezed, that's what we're let out. And so as believers, if we're, in, if we're saturating ourselves with the world, when the situations of life begin to squeeze us, the world is what will come out. But if we saturate ourselves with the word, when the situations of life begin to squeeze us, it's the word of God that will come out of us. And that's best depicted by Jesus Christ himself at the end of his 40 days fasting when he was tempted by the devil three times. He defended or fought off the devil uh, by quoting scripture. And Jesus was saturated with the word of God. And so when the devil squeezed him, what came out was the word of God. And that caused the devil to flee from him. So like many first century Christians, Paul acknowledges the persecution that the church in Thessalonica is going through. And much like the Jewish believers in the Judea province, uh, the, the, the entire first century church was under heavy persecution. So the, the church in Thessalonica was located in modern day Greece, far west of like Jerusalem and Judea, which would be the prime area where the Christian, uh, religion started in first century, uh, uh, BC. And so they experienced the same hardships of persecution, but it was more Greek persecution than Jewish persecution. So in the Jewish area, in the Jerusalem area, there was a lot of Jewish believers that did not believe Gentiles should receive the gospel. And then you had a few Greeks as well that was trying to defend the Greek way of life, which was worshiping multiple gods. In Thessalonica, it was kind of the opposite, where there were more Greeks and then there were still a few Jews. And so they were still under persecution, but it was for different reasons. Of course, it was the persecution of not wanting the Gentiles to receive the gospel. But because it was a primarily Gentile area, Greek population, as the church grew with more Greek believers, it caused Jewish believers to withdraw from the church. And they were overly persecuted by their Greek family and community members who saw them as rebellious and Jewish believers who saw them as unworthy or unfitting for the gospel. So modern theologians believe that the Thessalonica church was comprised of Jewish converts as well as Greek citizens, and all of them kind of knew very little about Jewish culture and Jewish Old Testament tradition and prophecy. So since the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he and his followers, they experienced extreme persecution. 
Jesus was crucified, 10 of the 12 disciples were martyred, and thousands of Christians uh, were persecuted, especially by these Old Testament Jews who still held close to the temple system. So at the same time, the, like I said, these, the Romans were persecuting because they saw the Christian movement as rebellious or a challenge to their political and religious systems. So Paul points out that when you're, in, when you're facing immense persecution, the natural response under persecution is to either conform to the demands or the requests of the persecutors or to become persecutors yourself. But the believers in the Thessalonica church, they have endured the persecution and they remain faithful to God's word, which is why Paul identifies that God's word was working in them to give them what was needed to stand firm in their faith. Now, it might be difficult for 21st century Christians in Western uh, society uh, to even imagine being persecuted for our faith. However, as society around us becomes more divided and more polarized on issues like politics, climate change, racial and gender identity, we're seeing marginalized groups experience persecution for simply living their lives or being the people that God designed them to be. Uh, we're right now in the midst of the Olympics. It just started about a week and a half ago. One of the most controversial uh, topics in this year's Olympics is this female boxer from Algeria. Now, due to a birth abnormality, she was born with an unusual mix of chromosomes, but she was, in fact, born female, and she's able to carry a child through regular re uh, reproduction practices. Yet there's been this international outcry because she looks different than one might assume a female should look like. And due to this large Algerian community in France, instead of trying to fight her haters or defend her, they just came out in large droves in her last two fights. Like the stadiums where she boxed at were filled with these Algerians that just supported this boxer out of love and support in the, in the face of this immense hardship and persecution that she's been experiencing. Uh, when they interview her, she's, she's admitted that it's been hard for her to compete. She says she receives death threats. She's been hated on a daily basis. And rather than run from her dream or hide who she is, she decides to keep her eye on the prize and just endure the persecution and keep going forward. As believers, even though we don't realize that we are living in a world that rejects our understanding or the God's word on issues surrounding sexuality, substance abuse, abortion and morality. And while we may all hold different positions or have different practices, we can't deny that God's word is clear on all of these issues. And rather than reject or hate the people that don't live lives that resemble our understanding of God's word, we should love those that live differently than us the same way that God loved us when we live contrary to his word. And we should depend on God's word to change their lives in very much the same manner that it changed our lives. The problem is that we don't only endure persecution when we reject the ways of the world, but sometimes we become persecutors ourselves when we reject others or treat others with a judgmental spirit or treat them badly because their lives are different than ours or what we understand God's will to be for his children. However, in this lesson, Paul makes it clear that the wrath of God will eventually come upon all of those that persecute others, and that we should endure as believers the persecution that comes our way and just simply allow God to fight our battles for us. There should never be a time where we should respond to the working of sin by allowing sin to dictate our own actions and the way that we treat other people. Just as we remain steadfast and persevering in our faith when we are persecuted, we should at the same time resist the temptation to judge or persecute others trusting that God will deal with each and every one of us in his own time and according to his own purpose for our lives. So the first part of our lesson is an enthusiastic people. The second part of our lesson is expectations of hope and joy. First Thessalonians chapter two, verses 17 through 20 reads, but we brethren having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? It is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming, for you are our glory and joy. So if we look at the ministry of Paul, his ministry was filled with these highs and lows. He found himself in prison and on the run in between these three 
great missionary journeys. And it's believed that Paul wrote this first uh, epistle to the church in Thessalonica about four to six months after he initially visited them. Now, his plan was to quickly return to the church so he can further instruct them and build them up in the knowledge of Christ. But he acknowledges that his plans were disrupted by what he calls the working of Satan. Now, perhaps after Jesus, Paul is perhaps the second most recognized name in the New Testament. And his life began as a student and a worker in the Jewish temple system. His life was changed as he was Saul at one point on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. And he was knocked off his donkey, blinded by the glory of God. And he heard a voice from heaven saying, Paul, why are they persecuting me? Paul quickly became one of God's most important servants, uh, especially in the first century church. And he was led by God's spirit to minister to and start many churches, not only in Judea, but in the Greek and Roman provinces. So Paul proved to be an uh, uh, exceptional and effective missionary, and his endurance of faith has stood the test of time as an example for believers even today. Yet even with all of Paul's faithfulness and his clear understanding of God's word, and operating within the will of God, Paul shows us here in the last part of chapter 2 that our plans are not always God's plans. Paul had a great reason to believe that his plans were correct, that he was doing the work to further the spread of the gospel, and that he was trying to encourage this new church, this group of young believers in Thessalonica. But God had other plans for Paul, and even though Paul's plans did not work out, he remained just as diligent and just as hopeful on the plans that God had for him when it might have appeared from a worldly perspective that he failed in his own plans. Now, when God shifts or when he moves in our lives in a way that is not expected or not aligned with the plans that we have for ourselves, we must never become saddened or lose our excitement and vigor, but instead we need to trust that God's plans are what's best for our lives. Paul points out to the Thessalonian church that all believers are in the midst of spiritual warfare and that the enemy is actively trying to interfere with God's work in our lives. And so one of the tricks of the enemy is to convince us that when things don't go according to our plans, that we failed or we've gone down the wrong path. But trust me, I've done enough in my life where I've tried to force a square peg into a round hole, but I've tried to decide what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. And instead of listening and yielding to God's clear vision for my life, I try to do it my way, and we experience unfortunate setbacks and unfortunate disappointments when we operate outside of God's will. Paul makes it clear uh, that he's already uh, been persecuted in life. He's experienced hardships, but in the midst of those hardships, God has always rescued him and delivered him and brought him through. And so now that Satan is busy working to disrupt the plans that he had, for visiting the church or revisiting the church in Thessalonica, uh, he doesn't use it as an impediment to his faith in his work, but the working of God's word has enabled him to not only endure this hardship, but to still thrive in the faith, face of challenges and obstacles. He makes it clear that just as sure as we should expect the enemy to work against us and persecution to be directed towards us, we should also expect God's word to produce a hope and a joy in the lives of all believers. Again, when we seek God's word and then when his word takes control of our lives, the working of his spirit produces inside of us what is needed to endure and maintain our faith when we face the challenges of life, the persecutions of life, and the working of Satan in and around our lives. So just to be clear, just to kind of lay it out as flat as possible, as plainly as possible, Paul was doing the good work. He visited Thessalonica, helped establish the church, and went on to continue on his missionary journey, planning to return to Thessalonica. When he was there, he witnessed good things, and he's continued to hear good things as he's continued on his journey. But because of the enemy's work in and around his ministry, he hasn't been able to go back. Now, some people might think that that's a failure, but Paul is saying that he's rejoicing because he's understanding that even though he hasn't been able to go back and his plans didn't work out, he's seen what the word of God has done in the lives of Thessalonica, and he's celebrating what the word of God 
is doing in his life, enabling both groups to maintain their hope, their happiness, and their joy, even when the plans that they had are not working out. And for us, uh, I tell you, this is my, uh, it's kind of like a, a special time of year for me. This is exactly the fifth year since I've been at Friendship. I started the first Sunday in August in 2019. And I remember talking to Pastor Backus, if I could just get three, six months, excuse me, to kind of learn the people, learn what's in place, uh, and, and understand God, what's happening here, understand the people and the, and the youth. And then I would work on a plan, and then by March or April, we would be able to get rolling full ahead, of, a full steam ahead with youth ministry. Well, the plan was working. I started working out this plan. It's like kind of workbook, this uh, handbook, if you will, for youth ministry here at Friendship. And right when we were scheduled to kind of get rolling in March and April, the COVID pandemic hit. And it changed not only the way we were able to worship and interact with each other, but it changes the way that we do ministry, not just here at Friendship, but as a church universal. And so what I've come to learn is the way that I've learned to do youth ministry, my 10 plus years of experience at Mount Calvary and Lilydale and youth ministry, all of what I've learned in school and through internships, now that the COVID pandemic has began to succeed, uh, subside a little bit, excuse me, uh, trying to jump back in the way that I had planned it is not an option. And so now we're gonna kind of throw out the plans that we had and kind of start from scratch. That doesn't mean that I failed at ministry or that I become deterred in my faith or that I lose my hope and my joy. But it just simply means that God had a different plan than the plan that I had. That doesn't mean that I was operating against God. It just simply means that God brought me down that path for a reason and now he's shown me a different path. As a believer, we have to do two things. We have to first accept the fact that our plans are not what's best, that it's all right when our plans don't work and trust that God has a better, better plan for our lives, for the ministries that we serve in. But secondly, we must maintain our perseverance and our joy when those plans don't work. So Paul ends chapter two of, first, of the first book of Thessalonians by encouraging the church, uh, and he confesses to them that even though he wishes he could have visited them again, he is encouraged with hope and joy based on the faith that they have is, uh, uh, displayed in response to God's word. So again, all of it goes back to what he's seen and how he's seen them respond to God's word. The word, uh, the, he, he talks about that I've been able to see a, a, a glory. I've, I've experienced some form of glory. And the word for glory that he uses in verse 20, it's, it kind of references or speaks towards the eternal glory that all of believers will experience once we get to heaven. Paul alludes to what he has experienced with believers here has given him just a small taste of what's coming. Now, a common phrase that's used amongst believers to explain an experience that's filled with happiness and joy is what we call a small taste of heaven. This phrase is meant to recognize when an overwhelming feeling of happiness that can only come from God himself. So Paul makes it clear that even though he has been persecuted and even though the Thessalonian church has been persecuted, and even though his plans had to be thrown out and he hasn't been able to visit them again, that their endurance, perseverance, and their response to God's word has for him been like a small taste of heaven, and it's encouraged him to remain steadfast in his faith and in his ministry. And so now we see how the benefit of being a part of a body of believers, being a part of the church, how it takes hold in our lives. Paul, through his work as a missionary and church leader, was able to take the gospel to the church in Thessalonica. And then their response to the gospel was able to encourage Paul. And even though Paul continued on his missionary journey, because his love for them never wavered, he continued to care for them, to inquire about them, and remain hopeful and, and thoughtful of them. And then the more he heard about what was going on there, the more it encouraged him. And so you have this kind of... Uh, chicken and egg circular thing happening where Paul's teaching creates their faith and their faith creates an encouragement for Paul and Paul's encouragement causes him to write these letters which in turn increases their faith. And so when you're a part of a body of believers, a healthy church family, we see this reciprocal relationship where we feed off the energy and the love and the excitement and the joy of others and we're able to celebrate and share 
and what God is doing in the lives of other people and use that as fuel and encouragement for our own faith when we face challenges and when we endure persecution. So the first part of our lesson is an enthusiastic people. The second part of our lesson is expectations of hope and joy. And the third and final part of our lesson is established in the faith. First Thessalonians, now moving to the third chapter, verses one through five reads, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we were appointed for, to, excuse me, that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it had happened. And you know, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the, temper, the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. And so our, our lesson ends with Paul beginning this third chapter showing just how much he, cha- he cares for the church and the believers in Thessalonica. And he, ch- and he shows them how much he has come to trust in God by paying to send Timothy to the church in Thessalonica from Athens where he was at to be their missionary or ministry leader. Now, Paul by no means was rich, and Paul, in his missionary journeys, desperately needed the assistance and help of the people that was with him. Yet, even though he was not able to go back to Thessalonica, he used the meager resources that he had to send Timothy back so that he could do the work and continue to build up the church. And Paul, he begins by celebrating this work. He celebrated what was happening in the the Thessalonian church, but even though he knew good things were happening, he still remained concerned for them, and he recognized that they had a need for a spiritual leader uh, that would minister to their needs. And so as much as we lean on the Spirit of God for direction concerning our lives and in understanding God's word and his will, we should never as believers reject educational opportunities to grow in our faith and our understanding and our learning and in our, uh, through teaching and preaching. Uh, for many believers, unfortunately, Sunday worship is the primary, I wouldn't say primary, is the only way that we receive or that we hear God's word. Especially in the first century church, there weren't many opportunities to study God's word outside of uh, regular worship. There were little to no printed materials being accessible. Uh, But now in the 21st century, thanks to modern technology, with the invention of the printing press and now internet, 21st century believers have access to more free, and I'll, I'll double down on that, free resources that can grow us in our understanding of God's word than any generation of believers prior to us. Now, while Sunday worship, whatever it is, day that you worship on, while it's necessary for growing in faith and for encouragement in our faith, we need to look at things like Sunday school, Bible study, Christian education classes, and perhaps even formal Christian education, and they should be embraced so that we can better understand God's word and increase its working in us. Uh, There was a question that we had to answer in in my... uh, pastoral counseling class uh, this past semester. And the question was asked, how do we respond to family members who say that they don't need to go to seminary, they can just use God's, depend on God's spirit to explain and reveal the truth of God's word. And while God is able to reveal and show us anything, we best prepare ourselves and make ourselves available to be used by God by learning the tools and the resources necessary to better understand his word. And so um, one of the things that I always joke about, I always say that uh, some of those cooking shows are racially biased. Now, I, me and my wife, Christy and I, we watched, uh, the, like sometimes we watch the, the, the great British cook-off or whatever it's called. We watch Nets Level Chef. We'll watch Crime Scene Kitchen and we'll watch, uh, it's another, it's, a, it's like a, it's a pastry baking competition but you only get, it's crime, a crime scene kitchen, that's what it's called. Now, the reason why I say these shows are racially biased is because oftentimes the type of cakes that they make are cakes that people in minority communities don't really experience. And so what I've come to learn is that desserts tend to be ethnically or racially segregated, if you will. 
And so the, the minority contestants often mess up simply because they're not familiar with the ingredients or with the names of dishes. And they've experienced them in some form or fashion, but not in their traditional forms, and they have somewhat of a disadvantage. But when they're able to learn and make it through the competition, the closer that they get to the end, the minorities tend to survive those early stages, and they begin to learn more about uh, the techniques, the ingredients, and the names, they tend to do much better at the end than they did at the beginning. It's because they've educated themselves throughout the show and have better made themselves able to learn more techniques to become better chefs. Now, I say all that to kind of refer it back to our faith. By all means, God gives us gifts and talents and understanding, and specifically through the indwelling of his spirit, he reveals to us the truth and the mysteries of his word. And even though God can do that fully through the working of his spirit, we can assist or support that process by growing in our understanding of God's word. And for many believers, we miss out on fuller understanding or clearer understanding because we're not as educated as we should be in God's word. I tell all believers that we should read the Bible at least once a year. That should be mandatory in the life of all believers, that we should try to make it to Sunday school and Bible study at least 26 weeks out a year. That's 50% of the time. 50% by all means in academic circles is a failing grade, but by minimum, we should be 50% of the time in Bible study. And so there's 365 days a year. If we worship every week, which many of us must admit that we don't, and if we don't a Bible study 26 times a week, that's simply 107, I mean, that's not even, that's 76 times a year. So, no, no, I'm sorry, 78 times a year. So out of 356 days, if we only go to worship every Sunday and only go to Bible study or Sunday school half the time, that's less than one-fifth, less than one-fourth of the total days in the year. As believers, if we are true to our confession in Christ, if we are true to what we claim to be, we need to dive into the word of God and submit ourselves to a rigorous seeking out of God's word through formal education, through Sunday school, through Bible study, and of course through morning worship. And so Timothy is sent by Paul to the church in Thessalonica because Paul is saying, wait a minute, I understand that you all have an excitement. I see the word of God working in you. I see the perseverance in your, of your faith. I see your ability to endure persecution. But even with all that good stuff going on, you still need direction and leadership, and you still need to grow in the gospel. And so Paul makes it clear that this sending of Timothy is meant to establish and encourage you concerning your faith. It literally means to place the believers in Thessalonica on the right path and then help them move forward on that path. When we truly seek out God's word, when we hear good preaching and teaching, it allows God's word to permeate our lives. And then God's spirit places us on the right path and moves us closer to God and along the path of righteousness. Paul makes it clear that this is what strengthens believers so that we will not be shaken by the afflictions of persecutions and difficulty. And then Paul reminds finally the church in Thessalonica that affliction or persecution will definitely continue to come their way and all believers will suffer hardships. Now, Paul kind of says he's not able to even bear the thought of them wavering in their faith. So he sends Timothy to them to strengthen them and encourage them. Because he's not able to visit them, and he doesn't want the excitement of their faith to subside. So out of concern for the church, he does all that he can do to encourage them as a fellow believer. As, as believers, and this is, uh, if we don't get anything else from this lesson, please hear me and hear me good. As believers, when we share the gospel and when we are active as the light and the salt of the world, we have a responsibility to live our lives in a way understand God's word in a way that not only can establish other people in the faith, but encourage other people in the faith. There have been many people that have walked into church and pro professed a faith in Christ and stepped away and never came back. 
because we didn't stick with them. We didn't encourage them. We didn't reflect God's love in our living and in our lifestyle. And unfortunately, too many believers have turned immature believers away and non-believers away because of our living, because of a lack of love, and because of a lack of compassion and encouragement. Paul is saying, even though I'm being persecuted, even though Satan is working in my life, even though my plans have not gone the way I thought they could, I love you enough to not only remain perseverant in my faith through the working of God's word in my life, but to continue to encourage you regardless of what's going on in my life. And I can tell you, there are some encouragers that God has put in my life, uh, even here at Friendship in the five years I've been here. There are some people here that have just loved on me and supported me and encouraged me. And when times get difficult and when things aren't necessarily going as well as I want them to, when my plans aren't working out, they come up and love on me and give me a kind word. They'll donate to the youth ministry here. They'll say something to me or my wife about marriage to encourage us. And so I praise God for encouragers. And because of that, my prayer with this lesson is that God grows and matures me to be an encourager in my faith, that my living doesn't turn any way away, turn anyone away from Christ, that when people see me and my faith and my response to the persecution of life, the persecutions of life, that they can be encouraged by the working of God's word in my life, by my perseverance of faith and by the way that I live. And so that's our prayer, that's our lesson. What a wonderful lesson, a little longer uh, than intended but a really good lesson. I think it's meant to help us realize uh, not only what God's word is able to do in our lives, but when we allow it uh, and submit to God's word and allow the working of God's word to shape our lives, that we can be active agents of change in the lives of others. As always, we thank you for worshiping with us in our biblical study. As long as God says the same, we'll continue to share our general Sunday school lesson overviews each and every week. Uh, we want to encourage you to support our church through giving. We do have four ways for you to give here at Friendship Baptist Church. You can give through our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can text the word give to 773-992-1462. You can mail your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644, or as always, you can use cash app, dollar sign, Friendship Chicago. For those of you all that have given and supported the work and ministry here at Friendship, we praise God for your support. We praise God for your presence. But most importantly, as always, we praise God for your prayers. Uh, that being said, uh, we want to encourage you to support our other worship opportunities. Uh, this morning here at Friendship at 11 a.m., uh, we have our live worship service each Sunday morning at 11 on the corner of Laramie and Jackson. At 9.30, we have Sunday school class for children, youth, and adults. And then we have individual Sunday school classes that are meeting uh, through conference call or Zoom. Our laymen and our men, uh, women of faith, they meet on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. We have exercise classes here on Tuesdays at 6, uh, 6 p.m. And then at 8 a.m. every Tuesday, we have our prayer uh, class led by our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davidson. If you would like the information for any of those worship opportunities, those Christian education opportunities or our prayer opportunities, give us a call, shoot us a text, shoot us an email, and we'll give you further information. As always, please pray for our church. Please pray for our members. Please pray for our pastors. And let's pray for every single Sunday school instructor and student throughout all of Christianity that we continue to be educated in God's word, built up in God's word, encouraged in God's word, so that we can be better doers of God's word. If nothing else, let's dismiss in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day another opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you for all that has been said and done. We ask that you continue to reveal your love for us in a deeper way so that we might grow closer to you. Now, Father, as we seek out your word, help us to apply it to our lives so that we cannot just be hearers of your word but doers of your word, that our life might reflect your word, that others might see our perseverance, our hope and our joy, and our steadfastness of faith and be drawn closer to you through our good works and closer to your glory. Bless our pastor. Bless our superintendent. Bless each and every person that's watching and listening right now. And let your will be done throughout all of this earth. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless each and every one of you. And if the Lord says the same, we'll see you next week, same time, same channel. God bless.